our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom indeed let it come, and let your will be done, here on earth as it is done in heaven. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and a pure spirit may you give to us, that we might respond in obedience to your truth, because your word is truth. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for everyone that has come. May this day be an experience that will prepare us for inheritance of the kingdom to come. Thank you for our visitors. Thank you for James, for Jovia, and also for Sarah, and all others that have come in. We want to bless them, and we want to pray that your grace may rest on them in an increased nature. And all of us, give us your blessing, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 7 of chapter 7, the Bible says, After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, as those of you who are not familiar with this, a beast in the prophecy represents just a kingdom or a king. And so, only that the Babylonians wanted to project historical events by using animals. And God made sure that he communicates in the language they understand. And so he also brings to us animals to describe the empires that would come. And so the Bible tells us that the fourth empire, which is Rome, will be so dreadful, it will have the following qualities and characteristics. Number one, it will be very terrifying. And those who have studied history know that Rome was indeed terrifying like iron. It was frightening. It is very powerful. It lasted over 600 years of reign. The beast has iron teeth. Like the fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2, this beast differs from all others. Because it has a feature that is different. Just like the fourth beast had the toes with clay and iron, this beast also has ten horns, but something out of the ten comes. And that is of very good interest. And so the Bible says, in verse 8, I was considering the horns. Mm -hmm. When Daniel saw the beast, for him his focus went to the horns. He looked at these horns, and then the Bible says, and there was another horn. And then the Bible says, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by their roots. In other words, the beast had ten horns on the head. So Daniel saw the beast, terrifying, terrible, and he looked at it and he said, oh, this is my... And then as he was still looking, he noticed that three horns were pulled out. And then like a small one came. Little and small. Have you seen a small thing? Don't be deceived by small people. S smallness is very dangerous if you don't know. <laughs> and so the Bible says in, verse, in the continuation of the verse, and there in this horn, this cow one that is coming, were eyes, like the eyes of a man. And the mouth in the cajon. Just imagine you are Daniel and you are sleeping in a vision. And then you say terrible, a terrible thing. And as you are watching, horns begin to come. Then the cajon comes slowly. And then the eye comes. And it looks at you. And then as you are still looking at the eye, even the mouth comes. And it begins. And, and, and let me tell you, Daniel is in a vision by night. It is also, isn't it night? There are certain things you can't see at night. You must not see. The day you will see them, you will never sleep again. Because you'll be afraid. So the Bible says, this small horn was strange to Daniel because unlike other horns, it was different. It had eyes. It had a mouth. And then it began speaking pompous words. Now the word pomp means speaking in arrogance. Arrogant. Boastful in, in, in biblical terms, the equivalent would be presumptuous because the word presumptuous means overstepping your boundaries, you know, thinking that you are smarter than all other people, so you don't follow orders, you do things the way you want to do them. When God says, like Cain, you know, Abel and Cain, 
God said to Cain and Abel, when you come to me to worship, bring an offering of a lamb and offer it because it will always remind you that there will be a sacrifice given for your sins. But when Cain went to his garden, he said, why a lamb? Let me take watermelon, vegetables. And so he brought very good watermelons, very good vegetables, and he brought them before the Lord, and he put them on the altar presumptuously. And then God says, the Bible says, God was not pleased with Cain's offering, but he was pleased with Abel, because Abel brought us the Lord as demanded. And so God said to Cain, why are you distressed? Why is your countenance fallen? And then God says to him, if you had done what is right, wouldn't I accept you? And then God says to Cain, look, Sin lies at the door and it seeks to conquer you, but I want to tell you, conquer it. The problem is that he, was not, he did not conquer, sin conquered him because the next thing is killed his brother. And that was the beginning of persecution. Persecution is simply those who have not done the will of God, who have departed. The moment they see those who are obedient, they feel bad and they want to crush them. And so the Bible says this eye, this horn has a very serious thing. And uh, the, this horn is similar to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, they were clay. And you remember if you are here, I told you clay had the connotation of religious aspects. God was simply saying this last kingdom, which is part of the fourth kingdom, will have political power and at the same time speak religiously somehow. And so the Bible says the fourth beast has a horn, and as the horn comes out, the mouth begins to proclaim. And so if the horn came into this room tonight, you know you people, you are joking. You are, you are bold now. But if the horn came and occupied those doors, at least the pastor is safe. There is an escape route. But where will you go? Where will you go, my friends? I, I'm reminded of an experience I, I told you about. Eh? In communist time, when a general and his army came in and they locked the door, they found people worshipping, they were seated like you, listening to the sermon, then they locked the door, they said, Aha! An opportunity for each one of you, everyone who denounces the faith, you have five minutes to get out of this place. The pastor was here preaching. He looked at his flock. He looked at Brother Nanoka, who is always spiritual and leading in the choir. And, and Brother Nanoka stood up. And, and then the, the guards were on the and then they cocked. And people said, this is real. So what they said, a few stood up and left. Then the general said, I'm giving the final opportunity. Is there anyone, he was making an altar call, is there anyone like pastors do? Is there anyone who would take the chance to flee for his life? <laughs> he looked. The guards came closer. Eh, some brothers say, eh, I have remembered. I can go home, fall on my knees and tell God it, he was also seeing guns were in the room. <laughs> So some of them say they, they, they stood up. That's what the story says. They stood up, slowly looked at their pastor. And the pastor said, you are going? They said, pastor, it's only that you are going to go ahead of us, but we are also coming. And, and then, <laughs> then they walked out. And a few members stayed in the room. And then when they stayed in the room, the general said, close the doors. Then he told those who stayed, I am also a Christian. But in our sacred societies, we have many informers, and some of them are within you. And so I wanted to make sure that I'm dealing with the real people. Some of us have not tested, but it is coming. And I want to tell you how it is going to come. I'm not going to scare you, but I want to tell you just uh, so that you are aware. You know, the Bible tells us that there were ten horns and ten toes. And history tells us that Rome was divided into ten pieces, as it is also recorded in the Bible. The first one was Anglo-Saxon, the Franks, the Suevis, the Visigoths, Burgundians, Ostrogoths, Alemanni, Lombardi, Heluri, and Vandals, who are in North Africa 
as uh, up here where we have Morocco and the rest. And so these were the ten compositions of the ancient Rome. And it departed in AD 330, it started disintegrating into individual units. But before that, the emperor had Thomas and uh, complete reign. But around that time, Constantine began to move his empire from Rome towards the east at a place called Byzantine. And when he did that, he had noticed that the kingdom was beginning to shake. And so when he did that, some of the German tribes began to gather themselves. The first ones went here and formed what we now know as England. And so in a nutshell, there were 10 of them. And the first one, which is the Franks today, they are the French people, which is France today. The second ones were Burgundians, which is Switzerland today. And the third one, the Alamanis became German today. But all of these, most of them were Germanic tribes. They fought against Rome or they brought instability in Rome and Rome began to split. And that was the end of the Roman Empire. But now it became a, what we call the European Union now with Portugal as Suevi, Anglo-Saxon as England, Lombardy as Italy, and Visigoth as Spain. But then the Bible says there were ten horns but then that Kalito horn that came, came and uprooted three of them. And history tells us surely that these three that remain Zerudis, they were exterminated in 493. This one was gone. And Vandals also, they were plucked out in 533 AD or 534. And Ostrogoth went in 539 AD. So those were the ten. And that power which we are going to look at tonight uprooted these three in order for it to begin to reign. And let us look at the description as the author gives it. Daniel says, the Bible says in verse 19, Then I wished to know the truth. Now, this is very interesting. Daniel had seen the beast. He has seen the little horn. He has seen what is going on, and he was troubled. In fact, in the previous verse, he says, my spirit was troubled. I was very concerned. I could not understand. Then I went to the man who was close by, or the agent of, of, of revelation. I asked him, what does these things mean? And then the angel began to explain what the, it means, and gave the following interpretation. So the Bible says, Daniel said, I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all others, exceedingly great and dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nail of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residues with its feet. And then verse 20 says, And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and the mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. In other words, this little horn that comes, though it appears little, it was greater than all the other horns in terms of power, in terms of speech, and in terms of what it was saying. It began to speak like a human being and Daniel was concerned. He said to the man talk to me about this little thing. Talk to me about this thing I don't understand. What does it mean? And then the Bible says in verse 21, I was watching. The Bible says I was watching and the same horn, the small one, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So Daniel is a bit disturbed. This little horn is not only speaking, but it has gone on and it is beginning to attack the saints. Daniel says, I'm very concerned. This horn is misbehaving. The way it's behaving, it is even more terrible than the entire beast. This one, what, what? And then the Bible says, but it did not go on forever. Because verse 22 says, until the ancient of days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints, of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So when does this little horn end? When does it end? When is the judgment? When would God judge the world? When Jesus comes, isn't it? 
Because the Bible says when the Son of Man comes on that day, he will separate the people and will say the sheep go on this side and the goat go on this side. And he will say to the sheep, eh, you did this and this, this, enter into the kingdom. And to the goat he said, for you, you didn't care, go away, I don't know you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, which we read yesterday, you remember? The Bible says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father. In that day, many will come and say to me, Lord, Lord, we preached or proclaimed or prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name, and we performed many wonders in your name. And so, this beast or this small horn will go on with its activity until the ancient of days come and judge the entire world. And that is why, when you look at Daniel chapter 2, the feet go on until the stone comes, which is judgment. When you look at this one, this carito horn begins and performs all it does until, in the next chapter, which you will do tomorrow, the next verses, until the ancient of days comes and sits in judgment and gives the Son of Man power to reign over the world. In other words, this carito horn is, is here with you. Did I say that? The little horn is where? Uh -huh. And even when you die, in case Jesus does not come, it will still be in charge. And then the Bible says in verse uh, 23, Thus the angel began to interpret. I like prophecy for one reason of Daniel. When God gives a vision, he does not leave the prophet to struggle with the interpretation. He explains the, the vision. So the angel begins to explain. Thus said that say the angel, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. And we already discovered that that was Rome. That means that this small beast must come after Rome has fallen. Because that's only when it can be operational. Rome must first be divided into ten, and then it will remove three of those ten, and then it will gain power. Now, in history, according to Edward Gippon, he says in his book, The Decline of the Roman Empire, Edward says, the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings was successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, Medan Persia, and Greece were broken by the Roman Empire when it took off the place of the fourth beast. And then the Bible says that same Rome, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom after it has fallen. And the Bible says, and when that ten horns are still there, another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Again, the angel reemphasizes the fact. And so we want to put three things that this, this uh, small thing does. Number one, according to the difference between its, this horn and those other horns, this one speaks pomp, eh? You people, you have never seen, have you ever seen someone who has, is dressed in a pomp style? White shoes, green pants, red shirt, and a black hat. When he walks in here, you say, sure, this is a man of pomp. This one will speak with pomp, and this is seen in 25a. In verse 25, the Bible says, he shall speak pompous words against the most, so the words are not against you. The words are against the most. So this beast or this power must speak something about God. Now, if you remember the memory text which we read, Isaiah 42, God said, I am the Lord, and that's my name. I will not share my glory with any other person. Not images, no, sir. So this beast must attack God somehow, according to the scripture. Number two. The beast must persecute people, the saints. Because part B of that text says, and it shall persecute the saints of the Most High. The question will be for how long? That one we will discuss. Number three, <laughs> this small thing called the little horn 
will, in fact, the Bible says it will intend, it will not change, but it will intend. You know why it will intend? Because only God has the power to change. So it will only intend, the Bible says in part C, and shall intend to change times and so the little horn will do three things. And if you are able to notice them and map them in history, you will know what that little horn is. Number one, that little horn must be able to speak things against God. Number two, it must attack the saints. Number three, it must try to change times and seasons and law. So this evening, I'm only going to sketch history and see which kind of power can fit this that is after Rome. And that power must uproot three. Then the Bible says, as the little horn is still going on, then the saint shall be given into his hands. For a time and times and half. In other words, God would say, in the same way God said to Satan, torment Job. So they tormented Job for a time. And when Job stood for God, God came to a place and said, you have done enough now. You have seen. Of course, haven't you seen? The man is royal. Is he faithful? So God reinstates Job and gives him a blessing. Even here, the Bible says, the saints were given for a period of time. And after that time was passed, then God again re-intervened into history and changed a few things for his people. And then he prepared them for other things that are coming, of which the unlucky thing is you are part. Then the Bible says in verse 26, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it forever. In other words, this small beast, it is only God who is going to consume and to destroy. It is only God who is going to take away its power. God will give it the opportunity to exhibit its foolishness until... It is finished. Now, I hope at that time we are still together. And where we are going now is where it matters. There is this man called Clovis. Clovis, king of Salic Franks, he reigned from 481 to, he lived 511 AD. He got converted to Christianity. This Clovis was reckoned also as another Constantine. You know Constantine? became a Christian, and when he became a Christian, he did certain things, which you will see later uh, in regard to Christian faith. Even Clovis, when he became a Christian, converted about 496 or 506, depending on which date, because they don't believe he got an immediate conversion. Sometimes he exhibits as if he was here or as if he was here, but nevertheless, when he became converted or inclined to Christianity, that is Catholic church, as soon as he got baptized, he took an offense against the Visigoth of the Voli near Potia in 508, disseminating them, and that was the beginning of the uprooting of the the, the, the three horns. You see, this is the point. <laughs> As the church was growing, there, became, there came a debate. Is Jesus Christ God or man? So people, bishops from the east, Turkey and wherever, and bishop from Rome, the west, they began to argue and come into concession to discuss and to come up with a position on whether Jesus is divine or man. Now, there, were, there was a group, they called themselves Arians. Eh? For them, they believed Jesus was not God, really. They were more on this side. And the Catholics, or not Catholics at the time, it was not as predominant, but those who were on the western side under the leadership of the Bishop of Rome, they believed that Jesus was the God, as per their discussion. And so there was a conflict between the Arians and these guys. Now, this guy, the Visigoths, were on the other side of the Arians. So when this guy became a Christian, he discussed, decided that now to eliminate this heresy, we must remove these guys. So for him, he attacked the first one and he uprooted these ones. He attacked them until he defeated them in 508 completely. And then as he was still there, Justinian, the emperor of Rome, 
in 527 to that. He says and gave a decree that from today onwards, the bishop of Rome will be the bishop of bishops. Before that, every bishop would come and had equal plate on the road. But what really brought this, that the bishop of Rome, because meetings were sitting in Rome, always got the opportunity to chair the meetings. So because of his leadership, Emperor Justin realized that even his kingdom was going down, so he decides that we must have a bishop over the bishops to make sure there is control on theology. So he says, now the bishop of Rome from today is the bishop of bishops. He is a universal bishop over the entire church. So the pope is the ruler of all the priests of God. That's what he said. The ruler of all the priests of God and declared war on the Arians who were against the divinity of Jesus Christ. So from that moment on, there was a united war to remove those uh, people who ascribed to Arians. And apparently, it is the other three which we mentioned, Heruri, Visgoth, and Ostrogoth. And so, as this professor says for history at the University of Rome, he says, to the succession of Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. As people began to wage war in the name of Christian, the bishop of Rome became more influential and more influential. So by the time there were no more emperor, when Rome fell in 476, there was a vacuum. And so the bishop of Rome began to reign in the vacuum that was left by the emperors. And so history tells us that from that moment on, when Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. And so Constantine went to the east in Byzantine, and the bishop in Rome was now the leader as they awaited for that. And that created a shift into power. That means that Rome, which was initially pagan, began to become a Christian political power. In that point, from that moment on, if a bishop said you are not in line, they would put you in line using political means. From that moment on, every king had to come and bow at the feet of the priest. And so the Bible had predicted this, and of course we know, Stanley in history, page 40 says, the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, their prestige, and their titles from paganism. He adds, the papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon its grave. Now, from history now, we know that when Rome fell, the power that came after the uprooting of the three is the papal power, or a religious plus a political power combination. Now, if that is the truth, then we need to ask a few questions. Number one, does this papacy fulfill the three? Because it must first of all speak pompously, if it is the one, or we look for another one. Number two, it must also try to persecute. It must not try, but it must do it seriously. Number three, it must also change time and law, possibly. If it fits, then we are sure we have the right power. If it does not, we look for another one. So let me try and attempt to see if I can find any trace of this somewhere. So the first action of this little horn, which is the purple power as per the scripture, is that it shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Let us look at some of the, the actions of this power and see whether it fits. For example, when you look at the book, The Dignity and Duties of the Priest, there's a time when they brought a, a paralyzed man to Jesus, and Jesus told this man, pick up your thing and go, your sins are forgiven. And the Bible says that the people who are there said, who is this man that forgives blasphemy? Because it is only God who forgives sins. But in this book, the, the duties and the dignities of the priest, this is what is written by the church. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest. The word obliged means that if a priest says no, God cannot say yes. And either not to pardon or to pardon. So if a priest pardons you, 
you are pardoned. But if a priest pardons you, God cannot say you are not pardoned. Hmm? And he also said, it also says, according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. So if Pastor Bitamazire walks in here and says, Nanoka, to hell you go. God cannot say anything. Have you heard that statement? My statement precedes that of God. I'm sure you are aware of that, Nanoka. Well, that is mild a bit. Let us look at a few popes and what they say. For example, Pope Nicholas, my namesake. Pope Nicholas says this. Wherefore, no marvel, if it be in my power to disperse with all things, yeah, with the precepts of Christ. And he adds in that book, The Church Historian of Islam, quoted and published in 1895. He adds, I am in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, has both one constitutory. In other words, me and God, we have the same substance. You touch me, you touch God. So since we have the same constitutory, whatever I say is exactly what God has said. And then he adds, he says, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. I then being above all, seem by this reason to be above all gods. Well, Pope Pius X is quoted from the book Evangelical Christ Dome, January 1895, page 15, published in, the London, in London by J.S. Phillips. He says the following. The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ. Himself under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Hence, when anyone speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine but to obey. In other words, when the Pope speaks, don't examine, don't ask questions, just obey. Why? Because in that flesh, Jesus Christ himself is. Okay? Pope Clement VI says, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman church and died in final impenitence have been damned and gone down to hell. Okay. Pope John Paul XIII said this, Into this fold of Jesus Christ, no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff. And only if they, are unite, they be united to him can men be saved. Pope John Paul II, quoted by Professor Arthur Noble, in the People's Astrology, published online by the European Institute of Protestantism. He was quoting Pope John Paul's speech to the European Parliament. And the Bible says, sorry, the story, the, the text says, he says, and I quote, don't go to God for forgiveness of sins. Come to me. You see, what amazes me is how accurate God is in prediction. God knew that there will be that power and it will increasingly become arrogant to the extent that it will seek to substitute his uh, power. Pope Innocent III says the following, the Pope holdeth the place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God. You can find that in the Decretos of Gregory the 15th book 1 chapter 3 you know my good friends uh, like I told you the Bible says that God is reliable in fact God challenges and says I will tell you things before they are 
you will not be amazed. I'm here and I will tell you, they will happen exactly as I have told you. You watch the space. Even when you don't believe it, just watch this place. Because finally, when judgment comes, you'll be able to say, surely God was right. Some of us are lucky and blessed because we live on this side of history when things have already happened. For us, we can just look back to history to verify whether God was right. When Daniel was receiving the vision, he was receiving it by faith and hoping that they will be exactly as God has said. Let's look at number two. The, the, the scripture says that it will, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And for how long? The Bible says, then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a times. What does this mean in terms of quantification? Well, let us decode a little bit here. A time, times and half a time. That is three and a half years. And how do you come to that? Well, if you use the following premise, for example, in the preceding verse, chapters, and that is chapter four, the same word used for time is done in Aramaic, and it is used for Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar will go into the wilderness and seven times shall pass over him. And when it is interpreted after the experience, the seven times become seven years. That means that each time represents one year. And you can find that in 16, 23, and 25. Number two, in Aramaic, when you deal with the plural of the indefinite particle that we use for Idan, in, which is used in 725, the plurals of times represents two, which is dual. In, in the Aramaic, it is dual. That is, uh, you know, there are, there are verbs or words, nouns that are used for dual. For example, when you say ear, the ear can't be one. They are always. So when they are writing such a word, they will write it in a particular style that you know it's a double. So when they write the word time, idan, and use the indefinite article, it always represents a duo, two times. And that is why this same period of three years is even found, or when you compute, it will get to 120, which I will show you in a brief year. And we use 360 years for a year because Babylonians and the Jews, their calendar each month is 30, years, 30, 30 days. Not like ours, the, Greg the Julian and Gregorian calendars. Ours map because it looks at the... But the, the Babylonians and the Jews use the lunar calendar, which depends on the moon. And so theirs goes to 30 strictly. And so that means a year of 12 months... With that, that will give you 360 days. So in prophetic terms, when we are computing for a year, we use 360 days, not 365. And so if you use that paradigm, and you can see a time, times and half a time would be one plus two plus a half, and that would be years. Why? Because time means one year if you use Daniel chapter 4 verse 16 in reference to Nebuchadnezzar, and if that is correct, then the three and a half years will equal to 1,260 days when you take three years and multiply by 30, and you take half a year and multiply by 30. When you get the computation, the total will be 1,260 1, days. The amazing thing about this is that we know we are right because if you look at this expression, 1,200, it does not only appear here. It appears in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. It comes 1,260 1, 60 days. Instead of using a time, times and half a time, Daniel now changes and uses 1,260 days. It appears alongside these ones, which I said I will handle on Sabbath afternoon, 1,290, 1, 1,350 days, which speak almost to the same thing. And then in the second position, which you will also do well to do, when you go to the book of Revelation, you find the same description, the same phrase, time, Times and half a time, you'll find it in Revelation 11, 2, and 3. You'll find it in Revelation 12, 6, 12, th sorry, 13, 5. And sometimes it's interpreted as 42 months, which when you compute, it's the same as 1,260. Or the author can use time, 
times and half a time, or not, one, two, six, zero. And if he does not use this, he uses 42 months. But all is the same time. And if you look at the qualities, the beast or the whatever the kingdom is doing is the same in Revelation as it was doing in Daniel. And so we are sure that this kingdom, the time it starts to operate will be the time the last horn is plucked out. And it will persecute people from that time until 1,260 days. That's the apportioned time that God has given. In prophetic language, for those of you who are not familiar with this, when we are dealing with prophecy, a day represents a year. And we get that from Ezekiel and from Numbers, Numbers 14. And we get that from Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, God says, And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. So prophetically, when you have days, in order to represent them in a prophetic sense, each day must represent a year. And if that is the case, then 1,260 days will become 1,000. 260 prophetic years. And that means prophetically, this little horn is placed at 538 AD. Why? Because that's the last time the last of the kingdoms was exterminated. Since the Bible had said, it will remove three one by one. It started by removing the Ostrogoth. Then it went on to the Herulis. And then it went on finally to the Viscous. And so we know that if we are starting at 5838 AD, which is our starting point, then this beast will go 1260 years and it must end its persecution or its authority and power in 1798 AD. Why? Because 538 plus 1260 stretches to 1000. 798 AD. Now, during this time, a few things happened. Number one, during the Reformation, there was a group that came up to fight Luther, and that group was called the Jesuits, or the Company of Jesus. Their aim was to protect the Catholic Church from the, the, the power and the advance of the Rutherlands, the Reformers. And so they gave themselves to the service of the church in order to defend the church from Ruther and his influence. And so they joined up and they grew up. By 1790, they were controlling Europe because they had built many schools and now they were teaching people into the Christian Catholic faith. And so that was very good. But also during the same time, there came up another group. It is called encyclopedists. Eh? They are philosophers of doubt. Those days they rose up. For them, they would doubt anything. They would, you would say God exists, they say, no, I doubt that. <laughs> then you say, I had lunch, no, I doubt that. <laughs> then you say, I was born of a mother, mm. <laughs> no, I doubt that. Then you, whatever you say, they would doubt it. As they were still doubting, there came another power. That one was called the French Revolution. Now this one said, for us, we don't want anything to do with ecclesiastical stuff. We want to be ruled by reason. So talk to me, what are you saying? God exists, come, sit. How? Is he a male or a female? Does he eat or does he not eat? If he eats, what kind of food does he eat? Tell me. Then, of course, with those questions, if you're a Christian, you would say. You would run quickly and find in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. <laughs> he who comes to God must first of all believe that he, he exists. And that is a reward of those who diligently seek him. So, don't ask me those logical questions. <laughs> I am a believer by... Amen. Hallelujah. That's why we are seated here. Otherwise, we would be gone already. You know? And then we know from church history, page 24, the Bible, the, the, the historian tells us the murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798 gave the French people an excuse to occupy the eternal city, putting an end to the papal temporal power. And then he aged, adds, the aged pontiff himself was carried off into exile to Valence. The enemies of the church rejoiced. The last pope, they declared, had resigned. 
For you, you can't rejoice because you are not in the dark ages. In the dark ages, the, what they used to call the Inquisition, if you read about the Spanish Inquisition. In the Inquisition, they were looking for what the church called the heretics. If you read about a man called John Wycliffe, he was a reformer from England. Even when he died, they buried his bones. Because they denounced him as a heretic, after a few years, many years, they came and dug his grave. They removed the bones because those bones must be crushed because he was a heretic. So they burnt the bones at least finally. Because they never burnt him when he was still alive. So they, they would come knocking at the door. Everyone who believed in the Bible the way it is and refused to comply to the church decrees, they were looked out and those were called the Inquisition. The king and the pope of Inquisition is uh, Nick Minos, that man who said God. That man was the author of the Inquisition. He took and looked for people everywhere. The Wesleyans, they are beginners in the mountains of, of Italy. They went for them. Those who were reading the Bible, they would find you, and that was the end of you. So when this day came, everyone who was running for his life said, finally, finally, hallelujah, God. Little did they know that God had already predicted that that would be the end of the persecution for a while. And then the Bible says, number three, that this beast will seek to change the law, intend to change times and the law. Now, remember in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 20, Daniel, when he was still praising God for revealing the dream, he said the following words. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are and he now talk to me if someone else changes time what is he doing he's playing God right that's why God is saying in Daniel that power will seek to play God it will first of all speak against the most high and take his place. Number two, it will attack those who refuse to comply by what it says. Number three, it will seek to change times and let us do a little synopsis. I was reading this book by Rick Warren. Purpose Driven. Have you read that book? Eh? Powerful book. This is what he says on the subject of time. He says, the importance of things can be measured by how much time we are willing to invest in them. In other words, if God is important for you, we will see that by your time. Let me, he says, if you want to know a person's priorities, just look at how they use their time. He adds, when you give your time, when you give your time, you are giving them, when you give someone your time, you are giving them a portion of your life that you will never get back. And so he concludes, your time is your life. That is why the greatest gift you can give someone is your time. That's why we appreciate visitors when they come, because they give Time, not so. They are dear to us because they give time. And so they, they, he's, he's spot on really. And then he says, it is not enough just to say relationships are important. You must prove that by investing in them time. Words alone are? That's why Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Because Jesus is more interested in your your relationship is defined by your time. That's why the enemy of God will also seek to alter time and make sure he enters into your time. Now, there's an interesting book. I read this book. I bought it from St. Paul's and St. Paul's uh, bookshop. And it's a, po a book written by the late Pope, John Paul, on the question of the Lord's Day. I just want to read for you sections because our time runs fast. Section 8, page 16, this is what he speaks about the third commandment. 
third commandment. He says, because the third commandment depends upon the remembrance of God's saving works. And because Christians saw the definitive time inaugurated by Christ as the new beginning, they made the first day, which is Sunday, after Sabbath, a festive day. For that was the day on which the Lord rose from the dead. And then he adds, in effect, Sunday is the day above all other days, which summons Christians to remember the salvation which was given to them in baptism and which has made them new in Christ. And then in section 64, page 50, he says, for several centuries, Christians observed Sunday as simply a day of worship without being able to give it the specific meaning of Sabbath rest. Yeah, it was just a day where people would come and gather like we have come today and they sing praises, but they, they were not able to give it that rest which the Sabbath really had. And so they were yearning and he says they were longing. So he says only in the fourth century did the civil law of the Roman Empire recognize the weekly recurrence, determining that on the day of the sun, the judges, the people of the cities, and the various trade corporations would not work. AD 300. In other words, the early church worshipped on Sabbath, which is Saturday. But along the way, people began to feel, since Jesus rose on the Sunday, Surely Sunday must have a special meaning. Significant one, as the Pope brings to our attention, they were yearning to give that specific essence to the Sabbath, of the Sabbath to the Sunday. And they were blessed, so he says, that the Roman power gave a decree that caused the entire day of the Sabbath, Saturday, to be dropped so that people now can concentrate on Sunday. Now, that is changing time. Why? Because Sabbath was the time God gave for his people to have a conversation with him in a very definite way. Six days they can work, but this particular day is fully given to God. It is God's time and it is holy. Now someone, the civil law, puts up a law that changes the movement of this, uh, uh, this experience. And people have to make a choice whether to abandon the former and take up the new or to stay with the former and also abandon the new. And the Bible says, so the, the, the man says, Christians rejoiced to see thus removed the obstacles which until then had sometimes made observance of the Lord's day. And in this Lord's day, he means Sunday heroic. So at least from the Pope's perspective, he gives us a history on how things came and how they developed over time. In the Quran, if you read it in that Sula 15, I think it's Ayah 124, it's good to read through the Quran. It has very interesting things, eh? if you like reading. I, like, uh, I went through it and I was very impressed by some of the things and the contradiction. This is what the the prophet Muhammad speaks about the Sabbath. He says, the Sabbath was only made strict for those who disagreed as to its observance. But God will judge between them on the day of judgment as to their differences. In other words, the difference we have between Saturday and Sunday, it is God who will judge, according to prophet Muhammad. But it's not only prophet Muhammad Let's look at Martin Luther. Martin Luther, the reformer, this is what he had to say in his book, The Primary Works of Martin Luther, page 50. He discusses the Ten Commandments, but when he's discussing the Third Commandment, which is about the Sabbath, this is what he says. The strength and power of this commandment does not consist in resting, but in hallowing so that it is set apart for special holy exercises, for, though, for other work and business are not really holy. And then he says... We must know that God will have this commandment strictly kept and will punish all who despise his word, who will not hear it or learn it, especially at the time, therefore, 
appointed. Now, when your father read that book, he says, God had shown him that it was not prudent for him to bring up that subject at the time because the Roman church would crush the movement. So God showed him that there will come a time when he will also reawaken that subject. He will raise up another people that will bring that on board. So he told him, for you, deal with this one of justification by faith and leave that to someone I will bring up. That's why he's saying, know that for God will have this commandment strictly kept. And will punish all, not some, but all who despise this punishment. And St. Catherine, the Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, published, says the following words. Perhaps, she says, or the, the article says, Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church has ever done or happened, that happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any direction noted in scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority, she adds, must be Seventh-day Adventists. So that's what she adds. But that's not the important. Must be God-fearing. That's the most important thing. <laughs> you know you can be a Seventh-day Adventist and you are not God-fearing. You are not serious. You just come here anyway because you just associate. After all, even Musda is an association. Not so. Yeah, is, eh. Isn't it? Yes, Musda is an association, so we can come and associate, really. Yeah, we can associate. But it must go beyond association. For me, I am a child of God. And when I come here, I come here and I'm looking at children of God, not associate members. But, I'm looking, but that is necessary for our earthly description. But we are children all of God. But she says, if really you think that the scripture should be the sole authority for you, you must be a Seventh-day Adventist because there's nowhere in Scripture where the Bible says you must change. It only changed because the popes believe that they are Christ on earth, so they can do whatever they find that is appropriate in their judgment. But we say no, as others have said no. We believe that God's word is the sole authority for a man, and it leads to salvation. In the Catholic record, September 1, 1923, it says the following. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof to that fact. <laughs> you see, the Bible had said, this power that will arise after the three and uproot them using political power will go strong and it will begin to boast and extend its mandate beyond the limits God has given. It will even seek to be like God. It will speak as if it is God. And then the Bible says it will persecute the saints. And finally, the Bible says it will seek to change times and law. And the greatest time changed, as far as I know, is the Sabbath time. But also, there was a change in the law. Some of you might not be aware. I was a Catholic, so I, I was shocked after I got converted. I also never knew. Do you know that the Ten Commandments of the Catholics are different from those in the Bible? Uh -huh. In the Bible, you have, you shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make graven images, nor bow down to worship them. That's why our memory text said, I am the Lord and that's my name. I will not share my glory with any other, not with any graven image. No, sir. And so God says, you shall not have any graven image. You shall not use the name of the Lord in vain. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy, number four. Honor your father and your parents. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give a false testimony over your brother. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, children, property, shoes, including my coat. Brother, don't look at it like that. It, it is not right. God says you shall not covet. And, and then the Catholics made an adjustment, of course, under the leadership of the, the leaders who have the authority to do these changes. So they started there as number one is you shall not have strange gods. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. So number two goes. And the reason is simple because in their expression of worship, they have idols. Eh? 
So you cannot have idols and have the commandment. You must have one of them. <laughs> now you people, you joke. Everyone who does evil must just fight. That's why the genocide in Rwanda, before it has, there is what we call propaganda. People will say, enyenje, cockroach. Eh? Now when you are in the house and you say cockroach going, you want to step it. So the moment you reduce a man to a cockroach, you can kill him, you can pierce through his stomach without any remorse. Even in Kenya, they started with propaganda on radio station. They demonize. Once they have demonized, you can do it. The moment, they, the moment you abuse someone that is stupid, you can slap that person. You are stupid. You have already justified the slap. He deserves it because he is. So everyone who does anything must justify it. You must have a logical reason why you are doing it. So the church has a logical reason why it has to remove this because it can, you cannot have both. If you have both, you are, you are stupid. And they are wise. Oh, sorry, they are intelligent. They are intelligent because the Bible says God gives wisdom to the wise. Uh -huh. So they are intelligent. So they choose one must go, so it goes. Then number three, remember to keep the Holy Day Sabbath. That's why the Pope said the third commandment. That's why Martin Luther, when he writes, he also says the third commandment. Yet in the Bible, it is the fourth commandment. And then they came, honor your father, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false... Now they noticed that when you go, they become nine. But when you are intelligent, you must make sure they are ten. So they noticed that the last one was too long for nothing. So they split it into two. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife and eh, then number ten. Don't covet your neighbor's property. How many do you have? How many do you have? Aha! Uh -huh. Now tell me. So for you, the Bible says, live as those who be judged by the law of liberty. And that is the Ten Commandments. So if they are going to be judged by the Ten Commandments, if you believe in the Bible, this will be the standard. But suppose you are Catholic. This will be your standard. If you worship an idol, you are not wrong. So for you who are saying they are wrong, it is you who is wrong. Because for them, they, are, they don't have it. They don't have it. There is no commandment that says, thou shall not make a graven image. But for you, you have it. That's why you don't have an image here. And so the, this, this power fulfills all the three that God gave. It, first of all, speaks very bold statements. It forgives sins. It says it is God on, on earth, and so it can do whatever it wants. And I think for me as a person, that is overstretching. Even if God gives us power to do certain things, but that is too, too much in my opinion. I th that's why I'm, I believe it. Number three, it persecuted people and the dark ages are there. Even the Spanish Inquisition is there. By the way, for your information, last year, on October 31st, the Lutherans and the Catholics went into a memorandum. of and They did that in 2005, 1999. It's called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification by Faith. In that joint declaration, they have agreed to forget the past. Whatever happened, let us leave it behind and begin to walk together as one people. People make mistakes, don't they? Do you have to forget? Yes, we must forget and move. So the Anglican Church last year signed to move on. The, the Methodist signed to move on. There is one they call it Reformed Church, over 8 million people suggested to move on. Um, there are still few who are refusing, like you who are stubborn, and you are very few, we will crush you. But the rest at least are beginning to gain. And last year they stood, and the, the chairperson of the Lutheran Federation and the Catholic Church gave a speech together, and they were very happy with the progress, and they feel now they are getting close at what we call ecumenical, Ecumenical union, and that is their theology is increasingly narrowing. They are almost believing the same thing because we have forgotten the past. Behold, new things have come. Let Daniel, after experiencing all this, the Bible says, Daniel says, here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed. But I kept the matter in my heart. Some of you are not alarmed because you have not yet seen. But Daniel saw. And the explanation that was given, 
You know, let me tell you, you people, you are not shocked. The Jews used respect God that even his name they can't pronounce, the name Yahweh. The name Yahweh, with, in Hebrew, they don't pronounce it. You, you just write it. And it does not have vowels. <laughs> Instead of pronouncing Yahweh, they pronounce the name which, which you translate Lord, eh? Adonai. So when they are reading in the Bible and they come, and uh, he went and then he, Yahweh, the man either would keep quiet, and he went to the market. <laughs> eh? But because they realized that some people may get lost, so they substitute for that and they put Adonai. So they say, and he, ca and, and he came Adonai to the market. Then you know inside there there was Yahweh. If they were writing the, script, the, the scribes, the word Yahweh would be written each letter with a different pen. And every letter you had to go and wash yourself. So you write Yahweh. <laughs> you, you cleanse yourself, then you come back and write H. You go back, you come back and write W. You go back and they cleanse and they come back and write H. That's how holy it is. That's why the name of the Lord, because they had known you don't take the name of the Lord in vain. You don't even pronounce it. So when they hear someone speaking against the Most High, Daniel could not live like that. He was greatly troubled because this is beyond description, at least for the other powers. They were trying to persecute, to fight Israel. But this one could look in the eyes of Yahweh and say you. <laughs> and Daniel could not take that. So Daniel was greatly alarmed. He went to bed and he could not sleep. He said, which kind of little horn is this one? Paul read about this prophecy and in the book of, uh, sorry, I've taken a while, but let's end with this one. In the Second Thessalonians, Paul reads about this and he reads about Daniel and he tells the Thessalonians, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by the spirit of the word or the letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. No, sir, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come and Unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. What does he do? Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called, all that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is and then he adds in verse 5, do you not remember that I told you these things when I was with you? How did Paul know? He read Daniel. That's why he said, do not despise prophecy. So he tells them, don't, be, don't, don't rush. It is not yet. Things are still coming. There is a timetable. And so tonight, my good friends, allow me to speak to you and to tell you in conclusion that whether we agree or not, God has spoken things as they would be. And on the judgment day, all of us will conclude that God was right. On which side you will be, it won't matter. Whether you are on the right side or the other side. But for me, I've made up my mind to be on the right side. Why? Because a foolish man is one... <laughs> Who, knowing the truth, refused to do the truth? In fact, someone says that an honest man, when he discovers the truth, he can do only two things. One, he changes his way and does what is right. Or, he ceases to be honest. Once you know the truth, you can only do you can either cease to be honest and from today say, I have rebelled, I'm in iniquity. So I'm not doing it, I'm not, go I'm not believing it, I'm not going to do it. And, and you remain like that, you refuse to, but you are no longer innocent, eh? you are no longer honest. Before you know you are honest. And from that moment, judgment is on you. That's why Jesus says, this is the judgment that the light came but you still were interested in your darkness. And so when the light came, 
you crush the light. I pray and I believe that as Paul has said to us, it is not going to come unless the man of sin is revealed. But the good news is, Daniel had already talked about these things. And Revelation adds a little more information to make it even clearer for us. If we only do our time and study the book of Daniel, it will be amazing. Because God is consistent. I do language, and in language they say repetition is emphasis. When someone repeats something more than once, that thing is repeated is emphatic. So if God repeats it, chapter 2, he says the same thing. Chapter 5, 7, he says the same things. And I'll show you in chapter 8, he says almost the same things. Chapter 10, same thing. Chapter 12, same things. Four times, God repeats the same thing, which means that the vision is certain and sure.